We're live, 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 live. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Singers Q&A show. What I do is I just I show up. You ask your questions and uh, I answer them. So the whole show is predicated on questions. So what are your questions for me? You can ask me anything about singing, training the voice, how the voice works, um, acoustics, voice science. I'll answer as best I can. If I don't know, I'll tell you I don't know. There's plenty we don't know about the voice. There's plenty I don't know. Um, anything. I'm happy to answer your questions. So I will... <clears throat> I'll get the ball rolling. <clears throat> Something that, that comes up a lot is just uh, the height of the larynx. And I just started to look at a study that was looking at really high soprano literature. And in classical music, we talk about this lowered larynx, stable larynx, and across the board, these sopranos sang in, in their upper range with a higher larynx. The larynx is flexible. The larynx needs to be allowed to move. However, when you're first working your voice, or look, we all, as we're learning to sing and as we maintain our voices, each day is a little different. You can have a bad vocal day. The voice wants to get um, tight. And so we will, we will need to work lower larynx exercises just to relax everything. It's very natural for the larynx to want to rise as we go higher, which, which is okay, except if you're trying to take your lower register and push it too high, and you're using the high larynx to create excess tension in order to push these resonances um, higher than they should go. So... Um, don't get caught up on this low larynx. And, and one of the problems I see with people who've been working their voice a little while is they are stuck in a low larynx position. And, and if you try and keep a low larynx throughout your range, you're, it's not going to be effective. You're, you're going to end up squeezing at some point just to maintain balance or the voice is just going to fall apart weak. So in the beginning, yes, you will work lower larynx exercises. You'll warm up with them. They're part of your arsenal. But in practice, the larynx is much more flexible in terms of where it should be. How do I work with students who can't match pitch? Um, so students who can't match pitch, it really is, unless, it, let's set aside that maybe there's some physical impediment, um, which is rarely the case, but it, but it can be. It's often here now there are those of us who who audiation that that ability to really hear music internally and create it with our mind is a little more natural but it can be developed and they need to develop this strong sense of creating pitch mentally being able to hear it with the mind and then connect it to the voice that's the second part and so we have to have these very tiny muscles that we don't have conscious awareness awareness of make these very precise adjustments. So what I have students do is really listen to a pitch and create it in their mind. And I mean create it as loudly as they can and get that pitch really loud, then hear themselves singing that pitch in their mind, make it really loud, and then they can just match, then try and match the pitch. Mm. They can do it on a hum, something that's easy for them. Don't start where in their upper range, in their, their transition, where they have some technical issues. Start lower so that the technical issues are set aside and it really is this brain. Get the brain really going, then connect it to the voice. And have them do that for a couple of minutes, twice a day. And within a couple of weeks, it starts to become faster. And that that process begins to connect so and and again the secret is they have to imagine it as loudly as possible how can you reasonably extend your range so first of all we all have limits 
to how far the voice could go. That limit changes throughout your life. It also changes day by day, even hour by hour, because uh, the at, at the extremes. But most of us don't access all of our accessible, usable range. The first thing you want to do is you want to use lighter closed sounds, whether it's coo 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 coo, gee 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 gee, and and close sounds are are more narrow vowels. Ooh e, they tend to be friendlier to the upper register. Go ahead and let your jaw drop as you go higher. Coo 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 coo. Uh, the other thing you could do through straws or through this contraption where I'm blowing a straw through water. Doing glides. Glides are also very good. Going from uh, using those glides. And then little by little, you start to increase the amount of cord closure and vocal fold contact. And you'll also start to bring in narrowings within the vocal tract. There, there are multiple things that happen, but you can you can start to use sounds to find it. And what you can do is once you start to find that little coo 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 coo, then you can add a little edge on it. Little by little, so you start to get a little more resistance, a little more cry, which is going to be the vocal folds coming together a little bit more. It's also going to help you boost the upper frequencies with the vocal track. Just doing this eh, does that. Making that little twangy cry sound will start to create these uh, constriction, good constrictions in the throat that boost the higher frequencies. And then that's going to be kind of this exaggerated high larynx. But then you start to you start to drop the larynx a bit. But you keep that same feeling of intensity, that same attitude. And you'll start bit by bit, start to find your way in. Um, don't push it. Don't muscle it. Um, and then the other thing is really working on these transition areas. If you're having trouble in your upper register, check and see what's happening in your in your voice below. So for lower voice types, male singers, see what's happening around this B flat three. For higher voice types, what's happening at this E flat four? Are you really, or even, and, and at that E flat four, do you feel tension coming in? Do you need to adjust the valve? Very often the upper range is limited by tensions that are created lower in the voice and then just become worse as you go higher. So it's it's also training the nervous system out of that tension. Um, let me see. Question is voice maintenance and fatigue. If you're feeling vocal fatigue, dark, except the voice feeling darker, how can you reset? What would you recommend practicing to reverse that? So there's, there's a couple of things to that, Jay. First, I would just kind of look at my behaviors leading up to this fatigue. Is this something I'm feeling on a regular basis or is this just a one-off? And can that one-off be attributed to a poor night of sleep? Maybe I ate kind of late. Maybe I overdid it vocally the day before. Um, and if that's something, if it's something you're experiencing regularly, I would really start to look at how you're using your voice, your level of hydration, how much sleep you're getting, caffeine, diet, all of these things, uh, basic health. Uh, but when you're feeling that fatigue, a um, couple of things. I really like using straws or some type of resistance. So this Dr. Vox... I use just, that gives me some, some feedback of energy so that the vocal folds, as they come together, they're kind of cushioned and it helps set the vocal folds in the right place. So warming up through straws, doing um, 
light vocal exercises on more closed vowels. Things like that. Um, making sure I, I use, I pull the, so far, every one of these, I've, I've introduced my little nebulizer, but I keep this at the ready. This is not steam. This is saline solution. So this isn't heating steam, which would leave, or the water, which would leave saline behind if you put saline in it. But this actually just turns the saline solution into these little tiny particles that you can breathe. So the saline stays in this mist. It stays on the vocal folds much better. So that's what I would do. And, and really watching, if you're feeling this, how late are you eating? What are you eating at night? It, it could be, could be reflux. That tends to be overdiagnosed. So I don't want everybody going after reflux, but that, that could be a culprit. Let me see, mixed voice. I struggle, let me see. Um, you, you can use, it is, is it possible I can use my mix on the first bridge, but struggle with it on the second one? And let me see. So that's, yeah, that's super common that one bridge works better than the other. And very often people start to get this first uh, bridge going, higher voice, female type voice. Um, the first bridge up to the B flat, and I, I use this um, word easy uh, in quotes. It's easier to, to sing up to that B flat in that um, higher voice, female voice. Over the B, this B4, it can start to be tricky. And then getting into this second bridge um, can then be a problem. I will tell you, things that work in the first bridge, they don't all work in the second. When we are leaving our lower register or chest voice, what we want to do is to stop this lower resonance from chasing pitch. So we do that through vowel modification. And we tend to make the vowel a little more narrow. And what that does is that takes that first resonant and it resonance and it just makes it drop. So in simplest terms, this, ah, this shout reflex is broken. And we can have more, rather than, hey, we have more, hey. See that, if I say one, that me, that's me starting to shout. But one, one, one. One, 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 now I'm starting to mix. But that narrow vowel getting into your second bridge, it's not gonna work quite as well. We still want to maintain vowel control. We don't want that first resonance jumping up too high. But more at the mouth and with the tongue, we need to start having this second resonance track those higher pitches. That's where your boost comes in this second bridge. So what you want to do is you go higher, start dropping your jaw, even start pulling your lips back a little bit and move your tongue forward kind of in an eh, eh position. Should feel like a, a cat crouching, about to spring. Yeah? And so it's a little more in this eh, eh. And, and the second bridge will have a little more of that, that twang attitude. Be careful. You want to apply these judiciously. You don't want to suddenly leap over into an exaggeration. But the bridges are different. So that's probably what you're feeling. You're likely keeping that vowel. You found your way into the first bridge through narrow vowel, and you're keeping that vowel narrow in your second bridge. Teachers will do that. I will do that with beginning students for a little while, because if we try and open up the vowel, they go too far. But there comes a point where that needs to start reopening, and you need to start boosting those higher frequencies um, with the vocal tract resonances. So, um, Dimash, yeah. So reaction videos, I, I am behind on those. Let me see. Let's see. Folk country vocalist training. What aspects contribute to the strong, open, higher register singing compared to classical vocalists with similar ranges but less, less strength? So I'm going to assume you're talking more about the female voice than the male voice. Uh, male classical singing acoustically is different from female classical singing. Uh, female classical singing is boosting 
more of the lower frequencies. When you make a note, you sing a pitch, you're actually singing many pitches at the same time. And the ear blends all of these into one unit that we hear as not only pitch, but also color. And if you ever listen to throat singers, where they these singers that can seemingly sing more than one pitch at the same time, what they're doing is they're using their vocal tract to isolate these little pitches called harmonics so they stand out. So it sounds like there's more, more than one pitch at the same time. We all sing more than one pitch at the same time, but the perception is that it's one. So with that having been said, classical female singers strengthen these lower harmonics. And what those are is that makes the voice, voice warmer, a little more fluty sounding, less biting. When you look at contemporary singers, including country and uh, folk singers, they tune to bring out the higher frequencies. So it's like, think of an EQ system. So I can boost more of the lows, like a DJ going or more of the highs. So classical singers, it's a little more of the lows and then contemporary, it's a little more of the highs. So the perception is stronger. Now, where classical singing really starts to find its wheels is for female singers is once it gets above, um, certainly this E flat five there starts to be an incredible amount of power in these upper notes because now these this lower part of the pitch spectrum these lower harmonics are high enough that they carry more energy so they begin to have an advantage um, in the the power sweepstakes and actually boosting those high frequencies as you get higher and higher up in the range starts to not be a good strategy so that's why country folk contemporary music and then classical music and the female voice, they sit in different, they have different tessitura. The notes that tend to be used sit in different parts of the vocal range. Yeah, Jay, so you're overcompensating on the gig. That That's completely uh, normal. Um, your monitors, you're, you're giving yourself your answer. So floor monitors are nowhere near as good as uh, in-ears. I know, well, back in my day, <clears throat> when I would gig, um, some clubs, depending on where you were gigging, you were stuck with their sound system and they're not going to provide ear, in-ear monitors for everybody. So you, you have to deal with floor wedges. I remember doing one higher profile gig where they had an engineer sound person just for the wedges. And it was incredible. I could hear myself so crystal clear. You have to be able to hear yourself over the band to the, to the point where you could walk up to your mic, band's going full tilt, and you just say, hello, and you hear yourself clearly. If you can't, then you're going to have an issue and you're naturally going to overcompensate. You can train yourself to not overcompensate. I um, worked with a, a very successful session singer in Los Angeles. And she, because very often she'd go on tours and back up for all kinds of people, albums, etc. But she often, backup singers don't always get the best monitor mix. And so just by feel, she could tell if she was in tune. She was really good at it. She... She had to learn how to do that. But um, if you can improve your monitors, get, get your monitor mix going, because otherwise the body's naturally going to compensate and you're going to squeeze so you can feel more intensely where you are. Um, this webcam, it's a Sony. What is it? I don't have the model number, but it's a, it's a mirrorless uh, Sony. And so it's just uh, running through. I've just got... Um, a converter adapter that plugs it into my laptop. <clears throat> so, yeah, and then just a, a nice lens that you can adjust so you can get that slight, uh, what they call bokeh, B-O-K-E-H, effect where the, the background goes slightly out of focus. This actually is not a green screen. So this is, um, green screen's a pain. 
And if I was gonna do green screen, uh, any of that light uh, bounces off the green screen and lands on my head, there's gonna be chunks of my skull missing. So this is actually all in camera. Um, Oh, what do I listen to on repeat these days? Any recommendations? You're on a Stephen Sondheim binge. Well, that's a that's a pretty good binge. Um, oh my gosh, I was so I was in this my Sondheim story. My favorite Sondheim musical is um, Sweeney Todd, and the George the George Hearns Angela Lansbury recording is is just phenomenal. Although I haven't heard the new Josh Groban, I heard a little bit. He sounds great. Man, the 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 uh, passion, the opening song. Um, I was in this acting class, very very famous um, acting teacher, worked with top celebrities, and this person, who at the time was the wife of an Oscar winning director, and she said, "Hey, do you want to do the opening song?" and the piano player was completely top notch. I mean, composed music for TV shows, could sight read anything. And we were doing the duet and we put the Sondheim music in front of him for that piece. And I said, hey, my, the parts are a little hard. Can you work my the melody parts into your arrangement? And he just looked at me and went, no. The, son, the piano part was so absolutely ridiculous. Oh my gosh, the hardest thing. But my listening binges, Man, I kind of I kind of don't listen to voice forward music. So an artist that I'm really into these days is uh, Stephen Wilson. And he's got a, a side project, uh, Porcupine Tree. That's kind of like it ventures into like kind of progressive math, kind of rock in and out. But some of his stuff, even his pop stuff is really, really interesting. And then I'll get into electronica, um, a song I was just listening to is an electronica song by Roosevelt called Echoes. So it's it's not a singing tour de force, but I just love it because it, it does this wonderful thing being in minor and then the bass part doesn't change the sequence, but suddenly it goes into major. And it, anyway, I digress. Um, Oh, cool. So the full cast album is going to be out in a month. Definitely check it out. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So I haven't been listening to a lot of musical theater stuff. Um, a lot of voice heavy stuff. When I listen to, I do like, and I'll listen to it in bits and pieces. I don't have time to sit through a four hour opera. I, I do love the opera Parsifal. Um, particularly there's a, there's a recording with Rene Colo from the seventies, um, that I really like, uh, and the, the, the final piece that Parseval sings, uh, Nur Eine Waffe Tacht is just stunning to me. So yeah, Wilson solo stuff. It's really good. If you want to get into, um, something that, that, that's kind of jazzy progressive, Check out um, The Raven That Refused to Sing is, is wonderful. And then his last album, The Future Bites, uh, gets kind of poppy and it's it's almost got like Tears for Fears elements to it. I did love um, the recent Tears for Fears album. Really, really, I love Tears for Fears. So, um, and one of the, one of the high points was, was being able to work with uh, Roland Orzabal last year as he was prepping for some TV appearances because I'm a huge fan. So <clears throat> I don't know how good of a teacher I was because I was completely geeked out and fanboy. Um, yes, thank you for the, the background compliments. Um, all right, any other uh, questions? I'm here till the questions run out. Let me see if I missed any. No, no. So I will tell you though, in terms of, of listening, 
I don't think that you can listen deeply enough. And I really recommend, because it's now with music, the way we consume it, it's so different. It's just, obviously, it's on demand. It's in the air. I mean, I've got echoes all over my house. I can just request any song to be played. And as we do that, um, it's very often just in the background. And you need to carve out time to listen as deeply as possible to music that inspires you and figure out why does it inspire you? What's happening? What's going on with the vocalist? What are they doing? What's going on with their phrasing, their vocal tone, their emotional connection, dynamics, all of these things to, to really hear what's going on and, and almost make it a meditation. I mean, I, I recommend good headphones and tuning out the world and just focusing. If you do that for 20 minutes a day, you're really going to open up your ears and your ears are your most important thing. That in, in being a musician, as you become a singer, as you start performing with others, it's really listening and, and being in this space, right? And when we first start performing, we're all in here. We're worried about our voice. We're worried about this note. Am I standing the right way? What am I doing with my hands? Do people like me? You look at really seasoned performers, they're not in their self at all. They're completely out of their self. They're completely connected with the audience and the other musicians and in that, that higher power of expression. Um, so Jacob does somebody to love. I will, I will have to check that out. I have, uh, I have to like work myself up to a, to a Jacob reaction just because I, I honest to goodness, I get emotional on every reaction that I do. And I, I don't try and do it. The first Jacob Collier reaction I did, I kid you not, I had no idea who he was. And I saw a voice teacher colleague of mine um, who told me I should start doing some reactions. I saw that he had done Jacob Collier and uh, the Coldplay song, Fix You. And so what I did is I literally listened to a few seconds of it just to kind of hear what he was doing. And I just heard this kind of interesting, slightly canurdled voice. And I thought, well, I don't know. People seem to be interested in him. I'll do it. And as I'm, I'm listening and I'm kind of doing the, the voice is doing this. Okay, I hear this. And then he just started to do these chord changes. And the next thing I knew, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm like, getting emotional like this is really getting to me on a profound level and and i remember stopping and i was about to reach to turn off the camera because i go i can't use this and i thought no this is this is honest let me just use this and see what the reaction is and the reaction was extraordinary and so then i did another jacob i got emotional again i think i've done four i've been emotional in each one so i will do it I will get to it, but I'm going to try and get through one without tearing up. Oh, you're in a six-piece blues swing band. That is fantastic. Well, so you're sharing a monitor with a sax player. So a saxophone is, is really going to be consuming a lot of the same frequencies that your voice is. Saxophone is kind of noted as an instrument for being similar to the voice. Um, so that's probably not the best choice. Um, I would, if you can get inner monitors, absolutely. You got a lot going on with a six piece band. I'm gonna assume everything because it's blues, it's all, it's all kind of roots driven. So it's not guitar modeling amps. It's, it's real amps being driven right on the point of breakup. And they need to be a certain volume to get that. It's going to be live drums. That's a lot, a lot of stage noise. So in-ears will seriously save you. Um, yeah, performing, you can't seem to get out of your own head. So Peggy, so that really is, it's one of those things that you just have to keep doing it. Perform, perform, perform. And then also 
practice performing, when you're singing, when you're practicing singing, spend your time warming up, spend your time working on whatever scale, exercises, etc. Work on your song, balance things, etc. But take time to just sing and practice being in the moment. Practice just being with the expression of your voice and the vibration and not worrying, not thinking, just singing. And if you're working with um, karaoke tracks, practice on seeing how much attention you can pay to the track. Listen to the bass player and the groove. Are you locking in with that? Are you going to push against the groove? Maybe delay certain notes? The production. Are certain instruments coming in? Is it getting a little more exciting? How are you going to react to that? Are the chords a little more lush? Or are they a little more sparse? And just really be into the music, how it makes you feel and express that. Um, getting out of your head, it's, it's a lifelong process, but it's one that you can specifically work on. Yeah, you'd given up practicing your guitar and Jacob Collier um, lit you up and you picked up the guitar the next day. Jacob Collier is either going to inspire you to do music or make you quit music. Jacob Collier gets to live on a musical planet that most do not. And not only what he's able to hear, but what he's able to conceive of and then create and execute is mind boggling. Um, just his, his understanding and his joy of music and, and even just the life that he lives where it's just music. He's just in that room creating music all the time or he's on tour. But he seems to have been able to keep a lot of life's distractions at bay. Um, There's a great, good, amazing guitar player from the UK, Guthrie Govan, who plays on some of the Stephen Wilson solo stuff. He doesn't know how to drive. There is, there is being a genius and being that good at something. There, there are things that you that you give up, and giving up some some of it's good, some of it is a sacrifice. But you certainly have to give things up. I did a reaction video to the to the new Wham documentary on on Netflix, and I haven't put it out yet. But you know, it just shows to me just to be George Michael, what he had to give up and just his struggles and, and even just some of the pain. So yeah, Jacob gets to live in a different world. Um, is it possible to increase the bass frequencies in your voice? Yes, it is. But you do it in a way that's, that's not what you think very often. What we tend to do on low notes is we try and lower our larynx. Oh, 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 oh. And you need to brighten the voice. Ah, 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 ah. I'm gonna ah, really getting that ah, ah, ah. Bring that in. And then once you have that, ah, then you can maybe increase the lower. Ah, 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 ah. I'm not a bass, but you can, but, but don't just increase the lower frequencies. Boost the higher frequencies. That gives the voice energy. The higher frequencies are what cuts across the room, what carries, what hits a more sensitive part of our hearing. So don't, don't dial that out. I did not know that, that Guthrie uh, played on the Hans Zimmer soundtrack. I did not know that. Speaking of um, soundtracks, man, if you haven't seen Oppenheimer, that movie's stunning. Not just, I mean, everything about it, but the sound in that movie. How much of the story is told through sound and the soundtrack. That's almost through composed. The music almost never stops in this movie. It's absolutely stunning. So, all right. Uh, speaking on practice, getting lost in terms of routine, what I should be practicing 
to see progression of my growth and my singing. How long can we practice before we enter the danger zone, etc.? So Jay, this is this is a question that that's not going to have a definitive answer. Obviously, the danger zone. You'll feel yourself start to get tired, and also when you're practicing, you practice for a few minutes, rest for thirty to sixty seconds, and actually stopping and allowing the brain to process is very important in practicing. Don't just keep hammering, hammering, hammering. Give yourself moments in time. I would keep a journal. How is your voice feeling? If a voice is tired one day, then look back, see how much you practiced the day before. What are your goals? And you should, you should, I recommend having like three month overarching goals. So if your three-month goal is to, I'm going to get out and perform, I'm going to record some songs and, and post them on social media, I'm going to extend my range. And now certain things like that, like extending range, be careful about putting these fixed numbers because sometimes we will try and reach for the number at the expense of balance. It really is about usable range. Of course, we work the extremes for flexibility and to touch that, but um, just really have, have goals, track these goals, keep a journal. And when you're tired, rest. Come back later in the day. And if it still feels tired, then make sure you get a good night's sleep and come back the next day. All right, fantastic, everyone. Well, hey, I want to thank you for um, attending today. Uh, we will certainly do this uh, next week. I appreciate your questions. And uh, yeah, if you have any more questions, save them for the next time. I'll, I'll be here next week uh, to answer them. Take care.